to introduce the last three speakers. The first one being Ramon. Ramon, take it from here. Yes, okay, Peter, thank you very much. <laughs> well, first of all, now this can take a picture. Ah. Okay, well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and in particular to Dr. Emil Kenziorda for his kind invitation to speak here. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I think I should start this talk uh, from the question that Max Moore asked me at the end of uh, the meeting last year. He asked me, well, but what's about the brain? So the first part of my talk will be a kind of summary of what I spoke last, last year. In that way, I think I, I can put in context the, the question of Max, and also it will be useful for those who missed uh, that meeting. And in the second part, I will try to, to explain what I have done in this time in, in respect to, to that point. So, in principle, pointing there, pointing there, okay, in principle, the cryoprotection, the cryopreservation of uh, isolated cells has not a problem at all. They can be all of the cells cryopreserved if they are, are in solution, if they are, are isolated. The reason is that when ice grows, the cells can move and can go to the places where there is no size, so there is no damage. However, when you have a cell that, is, uh, that cannot move, for example, inside a tissue, this is, a, this is an outside, this is a video. Can you please put the video? If the, ce if the cell cannot move, you have to, I, there, down. Then, uh, sooner or later, some ice crystal will enter into the cell and the cell will be uh, dead, absolutely. That is what happened with tissues and what happened with organs. So you cannot apply this trick of having eyes and cells moving around. In, in 1965, as uh, Ben Best said in the last presentation, John Farran arrived to the solution to that problem. In fact, uh, he had here a small uterus, and these are the contractions of the uterus induced by histamine. And after applying his method, you can see that the uterus was recovered. So in the 80s, uh, in the 80s, uh, Greg Fahey started some, some program, some research program using that approach. And, and now we are quite often uh, habituated to see this kind of, of pictures. However, when you read carefully his paper, you detect that uh, in all these cases, even if the viability of the kidneys are compatible with the life, in all these cases, he had eyes in the center of the, of the kidney. I mean, uh, this kidney could be transplanted, they were compatible with life, but there was an amount of damage in the center of the, of the, of the kidney. Of, these are rabbit kidneys. So by reading these papers, something like 20 years ago, I realized that uh, uh, there were two missing, two missing things, okay, two missing things and, and two, two very, uh, necessary things in order to avoid that. One is to have a map of the cryoprotectant during the perfusion. In certain sense, when he perfused, he do it almost in a blind way, almost in a blind way. The second thing is that you need a quick rewarming in order to avoid the eyes in certain parts of the, of the organ. So these two pillars were kind of my, of my, ways in my, in my research since I started something like 
20 years ago. So I decided to start reflecting on the easy question, how to see the cryoprotectant inside. So uh, we arrived to the solution, and the solution is CT. With a CT, this is the device that we have there. With a CT, you can see the concentration of cryoprotectant. In fact, uh, this were the first picture in which you have here something like uh, an ice floating in something like 50% DMSO. Or this is a, a kidney that has been vitrified and in which we injected H droplet of water that finally it becomes ice. So we can detect easily ice inside vitrified kidneys. So uh, this technology has been applied uh, quite often. It's uh, one of the last papers in which we use it for the cryopreservation of ovarian tissue. In fact, uh, we use this machine together with the CT in order to, to detect uh, the presence of ice and amount of, of cryoprotectant. The second thing is, uh, let's say, uh, what about the, the, the cooling rate or the, or the warming rate, sorry. What about the warming rate? I will enter in some technical details now trying to explain why you need a high warming rate. When you have ice, ice is made of two things. One is the nucleation, and the second thing is the growing. In order to have a large ice crystal, a deleterious ice crystal, you need first the nucleation and then the growing of the crystal. So if you represent here down the temperature, and you put here the probability of nucleation of growing, and you have your sample here, and you start cooling your sample, then it has to cross this region in which you have two both things, the nucleation and the growing. So at the end of the day, you have a, your sample stored back with these deleterious ice crystals. However, if you put cryoprotectant in your solution, it doesn't work. If you put cryoprotectant in your solution, these two probability cubes become separated, become splitted. So you have here first the, the growing uh, situation, and here you have the nucleation situation, or the probability of nucleation. This is very easily understood in terms of viscosity and thermodynamics, but I will not enter in why it happens, but it is like this. So if you have your sample here, imagine you have here your, your heart or whatsoever, first it grows the region when, there is, when, when the ice can grow, but because there is not nucleation, there is nothing to grow. So the, the, the sample is safe, then it crosses this region and some nucleation starts. But it is only nucleation without growing. So it means it, it is not harmful, it is not deleterious. So you can store your sample here with some tiny embryos of ice, but uh, they are really small and in principle it, it, has, it doesn't represent any problem. However, when you take from your liquid nitrogen and you want to reward your, your sample, then you cross again the region when you have the nucleation, so some new embryos can happen, can appear, but now you have the problem. The problem is here in between minus 60 and minus 40 because you cross the growing region. So these tiny uh, embryos that you have here have to cross now the growing part and then uh, your sample becomes destroyed. So that is why you need to, to cross this region as quick as possible in order to avoid the growing of this tiny nucleus that you have produced uh, in this region when you were pulling your sample. That is why you need a high warming rate. Uh, a few years ago, uh, John Bishop uh, showed this technology uh, in order to uh, have a high warming rate. He put some uh, nanoparticles, it's called induction heating or nano, nano warming. He put small iron particles inside the sample and uh, you produce some induction heating, like an induction cooker. It is the same principle. So the sample becomes uh, hotter from inside, so to say. Uh, it has some, some difficulties when you want to apply it because it is difficult to wash those samples. It is not trivial to wash. We tried many times in the past. 
the electromagnetic field is difficult, very difficult to control. That is why a microwave doesn't work as well, because the electromagnetic field is really challenging to control. So you need to use here electromagnetic uh, uh, field that is created by this coil. This is um, an alternative uh, elect magnetic field. Usually you want to visualize what's happening inside, but uh, with MRI, that is a very convenient uh, technology for visualizing things, you cannot uh, uh, put these uh, coils inside the MRI device. So you cannot see what's happening when you are, when you are throwing, at least with MRI. And finally, there are already stored samples in centers, in biobanks, wherever, that does not contain the particles inside. So we need some solution for those uh, cases, for those things. So we started to think on um, focus ultrasound. This technology is in use in many fields. You just focus your, the ultrasound in a point and you can have warming rates around uh, 200, 300 degrees per minute very easily. So this technology is in use for, uh, for example, burning tumors in the brain. So the patient is here and you focus the ultrasound inside the, the brain and without damage to any other tissue, you can, you can burn the, the tumor. So we, what we did was fair, we, we uh, create some computer simulation, we, we made some patent on the, on, the, on the thing, and we published the results, and finally we decided to, well, we made some computer simulation that was a critical part to be sure that uh, the technology works. And once the computer simulation tell us that this can be used, we decide to, to build uh, the setup. These are again the computer simulation. You can see here how homogeneous, that is the, the critical part, how homogeneous is the warming through all the three axes of the, of the space, X, Y, and Z, uh, along time. This represents the rising of the temperature with, with time. So we decide to build the, our device. It was homemade. This is how it looks like. This is the electronic module this, that we did at, at the lab. And um, we decide to, uh, to recover adult worms. In principle, adult worms cannot be recovered because uh, in the adult state does not uh, withstand the typical cryopreservation. What we did was to use uh, focus ultrasound to recover those worms. And uh, this is the setup, how it looks like. Uh, this is the the transducer, we put here the worm, this is the wave generator, the power supply, and this is uh, the worm, the adult worms alive after being recovered with these uh, ultrasonic uh, fields. So now the second part, well, in this time, before going to that, in this time, what we have done has been to go to some, you know, to some medical applications. We are now working with uh, a vascular tissue, in fact, these are aortic rings. In principle, if you need some vessels for the heart, you can put some plastics, some plastic tubes, but in the case of the heart, for the small vessels, you need some uh, not uh, synthetic thing. So the cryopreservation of this kind of uh, uh, vessels has a important medical application. And now we are pointing to the cryopreservation of a small um, mouse heart. This is our next challenge. So now going to the question of Max of last, uh, of last meeting, we decide to, de to start from the beginning. And uh, from the beginning, in our case, means doing some computer simulation before the design of uh, uh, the transducer. So we present here one of the possibilities that are quite convenient. Well, as you can see, it, it, it works, at least in, in the simulation. And uh, it looks like, like this. Here you have a spherical uh, set of transducer. You have here a parabolic one, and the parabolic concentrates the, the ultrasound here in the center inside the, the MRI. With the MRI that is necessary in order to control the process, you um, you have the control, you, you can do MRI thermography. 
So these are the parts. As I said, this, uh, these are the transducers here. This is the, the parabolic reflector there. You put here some epidemic glycol that should be called something like minus 120 or 30 degrees below the TG temperature. And you try to, to, to point to this uh, situation. This is how the pressure fields look like. So we realized that was a safe region in here that uh, can be used in order to uh, so something like uh, 20 centimeters diameter uh, organ. This is a small video showing the simulation that in this video, if, if you are so kind, in this video, you can see that there is in the middle a region that uh, it was quick, but uh, that is the, the safe region, in fact. And uh, in, in another way of seeing it, uh, this is the, in here, you can see the uniformity of the warming, that is what you need, uh, along all the head with this configuration. We can use other configuration, not, uh, not only the, the spherical plus parabolic one. This is one possibility that uh, could be convenient, but maybe we can avoid even the parabolic part. And uh, this is, uh, again, another simulation of the same setup because we try to look from all the sides. So each time you, have, you see here a line, there is one degree of difference between one side and the other. So you see that the, 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 the heating is really homogeneous in, in these cases. But this is not only uh, simulation, but also we have started uh, with a new machine. This is the new machine that we have. You can compare this. That is a professional one compared with the, with the one that we build at, at our lab. This costs uh, hundreds of times more. But it, this is, here is the heart of the device. So in here you have the transducer that is not like this, like before for worms that can be something like this. It belongs to Imasonic, and with this uh, device, this device is the heart. It produces the miracle of controlling the heating in principle of any rodent organ. So we hope to apply that soon to any mouse organ like hearts or brains uh, or whatever. This, this machine is for simulating the MRI because it needs some feedback in order to know in order to be sure that you are not burning the tissue and you are uh, heating in a homogeneous way. Uh, this is part of my team. He's Eric Dumont, uh, the manufacturer in, in Bordeaux, who, who made the machine for us. This picture is last, uh, last Monday. So the machine will be next to the day after tomorrow in Seville, ready to, to be used uh, for these uh, mouse organs that is uh, our next target. The good thing of the machine is that if we want to scale to brain, a human brain, we don't need to make a new machine. We, we just need to use two or three more modules of this, and this machine can talk among them, so they can talk, uh, and it is not replicating, it is not building something new, but having one more module to have more power, or having a second, third module to have even higher power. The transducer should be changed, of course, but should be not like this, but maybe something like this, but that is not a big deal. So in conclusions, um, Emil told me to be very tight to the time. In conclusion, uh, we honestly think that a human site organ can be recovered uh, by this technology. This is what the simulation said. We are now in the phase of doing mouse organs, that, but we think that if we can do mouse organs, uh, it will be a question of uh, uh, not, not that long to do with a, with a human. The technology should be guided by MRI. That is, uh, that is a critical part, and it is, well, critical. We can just shoot in a blind way, but uh, the ideally you need uh, an MRI to, to, to have the control. That is what, what we need. Um, our next step will be the recovery of mammalian organs, like a mouse or, or that. Uh, we have already the proper HIFU device. This is what I showed you. It is uh, something like a bit 150,000 or 200,000 the, the price. But as I said, you if we want to scale it, we don't need to buy 
uh, a di different machine, just more modulus of the same machine. And now the, the negative part, the negative part is that uh, we are, as uh, all of us, quite dependent on, on public grants. So this, these are very shaky, these are quite random, in fact. This is a lottery, and sometimes you have it, and the next year you have not. So doing research in this situation is, is quite difficult, in fact, as you can imagine, because maybe you have now the machine, but you have not the person that can spend their time driving the machine and doing the experiment. And uh, of course, uh, because my profile is mainly engineering and physicist, we are very interested in collaboration with people that can make perfusion, surgery, and transplant. That is a missing part in my, in my background. And uh, just to let you know that uh, I, I will welcome this kind of collaboration. And this was the, the year, the, the, the year, sorry, the day in which we grabbed the machine in Bordeaux last Monday. This is my team, Enrique, Manuel, Laura, myself, Juan, and Pepa, and nothing else. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I have, I have, a, I have a, a, a commitment with... Uh, <laughs> I think now, by now, everybody will talk. <laughs> Well, if you, uh, he's here, so if you, you can ask him. Any questions? There's a couple of questions here. Um, I, I mean, I have one, one question. So, so you pre presented the data or the initial data last year, right? At the, at the last conference in, in June. Um, so how, tell me how much progress over this year have you made in, in upscaling the science? Or can you can you kind of predict where will be will there be a cons a complexity step at some point or is it no, no. just scaling? It's direct, from my point of view, it's directly scaling. Uh, it is a question of having more power. Now the the one that we have last year had twenty five watts. That I the one for throwing worms. The one that we have now is something like three hundred watts. That is necessary for throwing rodent organs like heart mouth. If you want to do a, a brain, a human brain, what you need is probably two or three more models of this one. But uh, uh, probably once we have done a, a rat or mouse organ, the problem is solved. It's not. Uh, and let's let's say we want to do a human kidney, something not brain size, slightly smaller, but not still relevantly bigger than a mouse heart, right? Like what would be like ballpark estimation, what would be the cost to build it? I think you will need uh, two more machines. So means uh, something like uh, 300,000. Uh, that is the price of the two more machine. Each, each machine is around 150,000. Plus you need someone who do the experiment, who held the experiment sure. at, at the cost of one people. That is uh, the question. Um, one question here from, from the audience uh, remote. Why do you use a parabolic reflector instead of transducers in a, in a, a sphere? Um, does orientation of the brain organs matter? Yes, with the parabolic, you can focus all parallel beams into a single point. That is, uh, and you can, you can use what is called the far field. If in, in our case, part of the, of the ultrasound are lost because they travel, hit your sample, but part is lost because the, the beam focus and then becomes lost. It's like a magnifier. If you put some reflector, you are using also the back, uh, the reflection against this, this part. It is not mandatory, it's not compulsory. You can put more power and that's it. But uh, it, we are playing just with the design before ordering any, anything. Right. Excuse me. We had discussions about whether once the animal was brought on walk, Yes, uh, he was quite uh, quite um, interesting in that, mainly in the possibility of having the MRI control. I met him in Dublin uh, this uh, summer, and when he underst understood the, the the thing, he he was glad that there is this technology in principle. Thank you for telling me. You mean other ways of, uh, of warming? Um, 
People have tried since uh, 1960 and 70 microwaves. Uh, up to now, microwaves didn't work properly because, as I told you, the electromagnetic field is difficult to control. Brian Walk uh, is, is trying to use uh, radio frequency heating as well. Uh, it, the, it, they are cheeky. Probably he's quite close by using this radio frequency, see? maybe not yet, but uh, trying. John Bishop in Minnesota is trying to put uh, magnetic nanoparticles inside and have, he put this coil, like a cooker, induction, and this technology that probably it's the best one, but uh, this technology, because with this one, you have not the problem of the electromagnetic field. In all of them, you have the problem of the electromagnetic field. That is the first thing you think about electromagnetic field, but um, I am physicist, I teach electromagnetism, and I know how difficult it is to control the electromagnetic field. In fact, in these coils that uh, John Bishop have, you have large gradients in the axis and radial. So you put all these gradients in principle inside your particles and inside your heating. But uh, they are quite good, and uh, probably they will solve all these problems, but uh, these are different approaches. Yes, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yes, he is telling in moving the focus, and uh, of course, uh, the, in, uh, the machine that we uh, have now had the, the property of moving the focus in one millisecond instantaneously. That, uh, in that way, you you make a, it's like a PWM or a duty cycle, so you can you can work quite uh, homogeneous the sample. This is the idea, in fact. But, but, you, but you need, of course, uh, your MRI thermography in order to be sure that you, are, that you shoot against the right uh, place. There is not, this is what I, what I insist, there is not precision, it's an escalable uh, technology and scalable even with the simple idea of putting more generators. It is it is straightforwardly scalable. All right, one more question. Not, not yet. In principle, uh, people claim that uh, the cooling is uh, is enough if you put um, VMs, uh, VS65 or M22, something like this in principle, for the achievable cooling rate, these uh, compounds can do the job. The problem is when they saw the sample that you produce what is called recrystallization or denitrification. So you need a quick cooling. You can see it uh, even in your home when you put a sample and you try to rewarm and then ice producing the rewarming is not as trivial but it can be seen even domestically. So what we need is some, in principle, just the rewarming part. And people has not paid a lot of attention on that the rewarming part because in principle what they are, first you have to cool in a safe way. But now that we think that we can cool in a safe way, maybe it's time to think in the rewarming. And of course, for medical application, it is mandatory. This can be used for biobanks, preservation of, of the biodiversity, preservation of, of the fertility in better condition because now ovarian tissue is not preserved perfectly. It can be used for organ transplants, for organ banking. It has uh, all the application of cryopreservation. Even for, even for uh, a slow freezing, if you do uh, the a small freezing of your sample, the conventional one, and you shoot with the ultra, ultrasound, because slow freezing has also the problem of denitrification. You need to thaw quickly in your water bath, otherwise you have m damage. So it can be used also in that cases. All right, perfect. Then Thank I'll you. take over the microphone. And we'll introduce the second to last speaker, Eric from Remote. Eric, 
go ahead. All right. Good morning. Actually, good evening, I should say, to everybody out there. Um, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, I apologize that I wasn't able to uh, be with you there in Switzerland. I know we had a really good time the last time last year, and uh, I look forward to seeing everybody in person uh, again next year. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was some of the things that we have learned uh, over the many cases that we have done uh, regarding SST. And for those of you who have been around uh, some time know that the principle of SST has really not changed a whole lot. Uh, some of our protocols have changed, some of the medications have changed, but the basics of the cooling, uh, the medication administration, uh, CPS, all of that has remained the same. So why am I able to speak about some of these things? Well, just to start off with a little bit of background, uh, in my former career, I was a firefighter paramedic and uh, I, I've held my license uh, for uh, over 28 years now. And if you think about what we do when it comes to a standby stabilization, it's very, very similar to what we do in the fire service or emergency medical services, which is uh, we run codes. And if you don't know what a code is, it's basically CPR, somebody who does not have uh, a, a heart rhythm, they're not perfusing, and uh, we go and stabilize them uh, with CPR and, uh, and medications. So when we apply what we do with CPR or mega code, it's essentially the same when it comes to what we do in SST. And so we have had or participated in over 120 cryopreservations uh, amongst our group uh, in over eight countries. So we've actually had some experience in finding out some of these things that on paper are supposed to work very well and some of the challenges that we've encountered that made our uh, SST a little difficult. So obviously we know some of the protocols, we know the basics of it. You know, again, they haven't changed over time, but really what are some of those things that are unknown? What are those unknown challenges when it comes to SST? And if you, if you've heard us talk about um, some of those things that have happened in the past, I always say our biggest challenge is time. Really, that's what it, we're faced against is the time component, making sure that we're getting there in time as close to deanimation as possible uh, so we can uh, start our, uh, our services. So the time component of it is where and when. Where is legal death going to occur? And when is it going to occur? So I can tell you from personal experience and others may have, can, may have had the same experience is we don't know when this is going to happen. And oftentimes we are not informed of somebody's health, a declining health uh, in a patient. And so it's a last minute call for us. Uh, oftentimes it's post-mortem. You wouldn't believe how many post-mortem cases uh, we go on only because there wasn't the preparation, the notification. And to me, it kind of seems counterintuitive, especially when we're talking about cryonicists who are planning for the future and that we don't really uh, plan for the SST. Uh, so that's a big part of it is when and where this is going to occur. Uh, I know there's some things uh, that happen in which we're not able to get that information, uh, you know, a sudden death, uh, heart attacks, strokes, things like that. Those those are going to happen. But that's not really the majority of the cases that we see. We actually see cases with a patient that's had some declining health and, and the, either the family or friends knew about this, but didn't really make any notification to us. So where are they located? Are you going to uh, get to the bedside by plane, by vehicle, by horse and buggy, how are you going to get there? Um, as you know, uh, we're we're expanding. Uh, we don't live in concentrated areas. Uh, you know, we, in fact, even here where I live in Arizona, um, the suburbs, getting to the suburbs or the outer ends of the city, uh, take a quite a quite a bit of time. And uh, with more and more people moving away from from uh, a central location, that makes it even more difficult. So when we talk about time, we're talking about how are we getting there 
not only before deanimation occurs, but especially what happens post-mortem. So our biggest challenge really is that getting to the patient's bedside. And today it's actually been a little more difficult because most of our cases, well, we arrive by air. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about a, um, uh, a specific case in which we had the opportunity to either drive or fly uh, and have what kind of problems that poses. But we are often faced with limited flight availability or delayed flights or even flat out canceled flights. We've experienced that several times already. And as you can imagine, we're carrying a lot of equipment with us. Uh, we're carrying uh, all of our surgical, our perfusion equipment, um, and everything that we need to do our job properly when it comes to SST. And we're really just stuck in the water. We're dead in the water. We're not able to do anything. We're not able to get to the patient's bedside on time. Um, and we're, we're really at the mercy of the airlines. And that's becoming a more frequent problem for us that we're seeing. Um, the other thing is, is what time of day is, are we getting the notification at uh, 8 a.m.? Or are we getting the notification at 11 p.m.? A commercial flight availability is very, very limited. So if you can imagine, you, we're not able to get flights at 11 p.m. or midnight. Um, 3 a.m., yeah, we're really we really have to wait until the morning. So the time of day really plays a big part on uh, the, the SST and the time component, because oftentimes we, we just have to wait until the morning to, to catch a flight. Now we're able to book flights, but that doesn't mean that we're able to get out. So if you overcome these time delays and getting to the patient's bedside, great. Um, and it seems like it would be an easy problem, but I can tell you just from my experience and our team's experience, this has been uh, quite a challenge for us. Um, if you've heard my talks in the past, you've heard me say, uh, being conservative is, is, is not a good thing. Uh, we don't want you to be uh, waiting to the last minute. Uh, we want you to be, uh, we want you to be proactive. We want to get there early. Um, we, we would rather be there too early at the patient's bedside than too late. Um, I know that's, uh, that's often uh, a juggle. Uh, there's a fine line between too early and too late there. And it's often hard to really judge when that is gonna happen. So let's say that we've overcome this time challenge and we are able to get to uh, to the patient's bedside. Well, do you have a properly trained and equipped SST team? Um, you know, in the past we've used uh, volunteers, which are, are great. Uh, we we love the the additional help when it comes to the volunteers, but are they readily available? Um, is the team given enough advance notice of deanimation, like I mentioned before? You know, these types of things for us uh, are critical because it's a sudden type of response, just like an EMS. We get the call, there's somebody in, uh, in distress, and we need to respond. Essentially, it's the same thing. Um, you know, us here at uh, ICE, we often joke that we should wear pagers and we should uh, have our own station, which we have our bunks like we did in the fire service, and we would have an alarm bell inside of our uh, our, our station, and uh, we would hop into our vehicle and we would respond just like we do in an ambulance or, or a fire engine. Um, we we don't have the volume that uh, we have in an EMS or fire service uh, in chronic, so obviously that's uh, that's not really feasible. Um, but if you think about it, it's essentially the same thing proper training, proper equipment, readily available to go at any time, uh, even if it is 3 a.m., like we've had several in the past uh, notifications at 3 a.m., and we're able to respond. Uh, we often joke also that uh, we would love to have our own vehicles, but even more importantly, uh, because of the distance between our patients, is to have our own aircraft. Uh, if we had our own aircraft, uh, we've shortened that time of response quite a bit, uh, we're able to just uh, get into our own aircraft, fly to the patient's bedside, sometimes even closer uh, than we can in uh, major metropolitan areas. Uh, so we're able to small, fly into smaller airports, 
that it may be closer to the patient and shave off that time. Again, time for us is, uh, is, is our biggest challenge. So in the standby, we want to get there as close to legal pronouncement as possible. And again, this is very, very difficult to predict. We, we don't know when this is gonna occur. And for us, our challenge is that time and the temperature. Um, I mentioned that we've had several cases in which they are post-mortem and uh, we don't have uh, somebody that is there with them to be able to start that those cooling procedures. So our temperature is uh, against us. You know, we're, we're, we're uh, against uh, warm ischemia. And uh, for, for us to be able to have put somebody there, uh, boots on the ground, so to speak, um, we have to have that advance notice. And, and again, that's that's one of those challenges that we have noticed. So let's talk about an actual case that we have had. Uh, just to kind of summarize some of these things that we've been talking about. We received a call to deploy at 11.02 p.m. for a patient located in Denver, Colorado, here in the United States. Their time of deanimation was 9.44 p.m., uh, so there was a little delay in the notification uh, for us uh, to respond. Um, the details behind that were, are a little tricky. Sometimes people are, are alone. Uh, sometimes the uh, it happens so quickly and the friends and family members um, uh, don't think about the cryonics piece of it because, you know, they're they're really concerned about the, their loved one. Um, so there may be a delay in the notification from deanimation or legal death to uh, to us uh, or to the cryonics uh, facility. So that's that's another thing we're we're, we're up against that time clock. Um, out of our control, really nothing that that any of us can do about that other than educate, pre-plan, make sure that all of our members know that this is extremely important uh, for us to get this advance notice. The first flight was not available until 6.20 a.m. Uh, so if you can imagine, we were ready, got the notification at 11, we could get our equipment ready to go in less than an hour. And, and, uh, and if we needed to, we could be at the patient bedside if they were close. Uh, within just a few minutes, but because of commercial flight availability, we weren't able to leave until the early morning. Uh, the flight time is one hour and uh, 49 minutes, so not a lot long fl flight time from Phoenix to Denver. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very short flight, uh, but if we were to drive that, it would have been about 12 hours and 43 minutes, and that's without any fuel stops or, more importantly, any bathroom breaks uh, in there. And so the time piece of it uh, was negligible as far as waiting to the morning to get onto a flight or if we were going to drive uh, uh, over to where, where the patient's located. We actually arrived at 9.04. Um, you know, when we take commercial flights, we have to uh, get a vehicle or have a vehicle waiting there for us to pick us up and all of our equipment. We have to get to the patient's bedside and, uh, again, you know, flying into major metropolitan uh, airports may not be located close to the patient if they are located outside of those those areas. Several times we have had to drive two plus, sometimes three plus hours from the airport to get to the patient's bedside. So again, that time component of it is uh, is against us because not only are we in the same city or the uh, the state uh, in which the patient is located. Um, but then we have another drive on top of that uh, to get to the location of the patient. So as you can imagine, um, we we have to figure these things out. Um, no two scenarios are the same in this, and that's why it, the, the, it's it's very challenging because we're working through these problems, different problems each time. So let's move on to the stabilization portion of it. What type of challenges have we had when it comes to stabilization? Well, again, what we want to do is we want to arrive before legal pronouncement. And for us, it's 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 kind of a toss-up whether we get that notification or we don't. Uh, the equipment is uh, one of those things where, just like an EMS, we need to ensure we have the proper equipment uh, to do our jobs. Now, each of these stabilization procedures are different um, if we're doing a whole body if we're doing a whole body on neuro for some of our clients that we do, or some of our clients uh, also do neuro patients. And so we need to make sure that we have all of the equipment to be able to do every single one of, of those procedures. Uh, sometimes that means that that equipment 
uh, cash starts to get rather large. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not young anymore, um, and uh, it it's become very difficult sometimes to uh, carry this equipment because they're large and they're heavy. And so that means we need more team members there uh, to be able to do the heavy lifting when it comes to the equipment because we need to carry all of our stuff with us. So if you can imagine, if you've done all this planning, uh, you bring your equipment to the bedside and you forgot one or two critical items, you may be dead in the water again based upon uh, uh, what equipment that you have. So there's no second chance uh, to go back and get the proper equipment. You need to ensure that you have all of that ready and, and serviceable equipment ready to go um, at all times. Uh, I'll give you, I'll tell you a little story about some of our equipment. Um, we all know that we use a compression, external compression device for our chest compressions. Uh, otherwise, we're doing manual compressions like we used to do back in the Johnny and Roy days uh, and, you know, get really tired. But now we use a, a mechanical uh, piece of equipment to do that. Most of the equipment that we use is a battery operated equipment. And for us in cryonics, we don't just uh, use it for a short period of time. And these devices were designed for EMS, emergency medical services, to be used maybe about 30 minutes or so, maybe, maybe 45 tops, 45 minutes tops, just enough to get them from the location to an emergency room. That's really what the, we were bridging the time with the mechanical device was for. It's just a short period of time. Well, in cryonics, we are going maybe at 45 minutes to an hour of compression. And uh, we quickly realized that the, these devices were not robust enough to be able to handle that length of time to be staying on that, that long. Um, when we first started, we were using pneumatic devices, we moved to batteries, batteries would overheat, the devices would overheat, and uh, we would be stuck without this critical piece of equipment, and we'd have to revert back to manual compression. So that's just one example of some of those challenges that we've had when it comes to equipment. Um, I can tell you that we have had uh, challenges when it comes to ventilation, uh, when it comes to airway. Um, it, it, there's a variety of different challenges uh, if you don't have the proper equipment. And again, if we are planning properly, we're bringing extra redundant equipment, uh, maybe even more than what we need, uh, just to make sure that we have it there um, on site. Proficient staff. Uh, this one, I think, has been the, the real eye opener for me and uh, the, the people that work with ICE is how are we ensuring that we're going to have proficient staff there to be able to perform this uh, procedure? I mentioned volunteers, which I think, again, are great. We, we love to have volunteers to be able to, to help us. Um, it's important for us to understand that they play a, a, a part in, in this whole process, but how do you ensure that they remain proficient? And so we often go do training with, uh, with volunteer staff, with bystander staff. Some of them may have some medical training, but oftentimes they do not. And if you can imagine trying to teach a non-medical person to start an IV or to put an airway in uh, or to do medication administration or uh, an IO device, um, we may be able to do it. Um, they, they may be uh, able to perform that uh, during the training. But how long does, uh, how, what, what time of time goes by before they're able to do that in real life? And do they maintain that proficiency during that time? We have seen that the proficiency, they're, they're, that people do not uh, obtain proficiency, especially when they're non-medical professionals, uh, even after uh, our, our training. So if, if, if anybody's uh, in the medical field, you probably have heard of uh, Benner's five stages of nurse development. And this is kind of what we see when it comes to proficiency uh, when it comes to bystanders uh, in the chronic field. Uh, we take novice and we try to train them to an advanced beginner. Um, again, it may be one or two training sessions, uh, but what's the frequency of, of the training sessions beyond that? Are we doing it every year? Are we doing it every two years? And are they going to be able to remember all of those things that we trained in that session? 
really we want them to get to a comp to where they're competent, uh, a competent person to be able to perform these things. But really, you need somebody there who is proficient. You need somebody who is able to guide, direct, coach, mentor, and possibly train those team members to be able to perform these things uh, in a proficient manner. And again, uh, the volunteers are important, but everybody has their own uh, jobs. They have their, their own lives, and they're not solely focused on this piece of it to maintain their competency. Uh, so this for us is, has been one of those things where we say it's not only uh, the cryonics field itself, uh, but it's us also internally when it comes to those SST providers out there. Are we providing the SST service on a full-time basis? Like I mentioned before, where we're readily available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, where when the alarm goes off, we hop out of bed and we respond to the location. Or is this something that is done uh, secondary, second secondary to to our other jobs? Um, the volume is not there for us to be able to support something like that, um, unless you have some uh, outside sources that have the financial means to support an organization to to remain uh, fully readily available twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. So, in the stabilization piece of it. Uh, we're going to do rapid cooling via wet ice cps as i mentioned before medication administration these things are all uh all items that not only are your volunteers uh going to need to be able to do but your staff is going to need to be able to do these also with proficiency um, and again we're not able to do any of this until we arrive at the patient's bedside which again we're, we're bumping up that time factor so let's say that we do all of this um and we are not going to perform uh, FCP, which is the field cryopreservation. This is our normal uh, procedure is to do a blood washout uh, and then get the patient back to the facility. We transport back to the facility so we can perform the surgery. Uh, we can introduce the cryoprotectant and, uh, and uh, we can uh, start the, the cooling. Um, the transportation piece of it, we don't know when we're gonna be able to transport. For us, we, we bump up into challenges when it comes to the transportation because we're going back to a cryonics facility to introduce that, this, this cryoprotectant. Well, how are we getting there? Are we getting there by ground? Are we getting there by air? What are the legal challenges? Are we getting cooperation from the medical facilities? I can tell you in my experience that some of them have been very difficult to work with. Um, on, this, on the very last case that we had just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a very uncooperative medical facility who would not give us any information on the patient's status, wouldn't even tell us if the patient was in the facility at all. Um, sometimes we don't get cooperation from the family members themselves. And this goes back to what I was talking about, the time challenge, uh, which was we don't get the notification. What about transportation of human remains across borders? You know, that's a that's another matter in which each country has their own rules and regulations when it comes to human remains. Uh, even here in the United States, uh, it's state by state. So we're not going to be able to uh, transport human remains across state uh, state border without the proper documentation. And sometimes that documentation is is difficult to get. And then there's the perception of cryonics. Not everybody knows what this is. Uh, it's very science fiction to some, and 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 they we don't have everybody believing in the science like like we understand it, and so we have to overcome those challenges too. And and I can tell you that sometimes that's that's been very difficult. So just kind of talk about some of this uh, stabilization piece piece of it. Um, we were call we received a call to deploy on a Friday afternoon. So afternoon, great, we have enough time to get commercial airlines. Uh, we can get to the patient's bedside uh, within just a few hours. Uh, in fact, this one, we arrived on this evening of the same day. We completed the stabilization early Saturday morning. So it was maybe two or three o'clock in the morning uh, in which we uh, completed the stabilization, but we're unable to get a human remains transit permit until Monday. And if you can imagine, you know, we're up against the time to get the patient into surgery to be able to introduce the cryoprotectant and now we have to wait till Monday. This is a huge problem for us. Um, 
And, and you know, when we introduce uh, FCP, I think that overcomes some of these challenges, but not everybody does it that way. We don't, we don't have a, a, a across the board FCP uh, protocol in place. So we weren't able to get there until, get to the Chronics facility until 11.04 Monday morning. That's a lot of time. You know, if you take a look at the map of the United States here, uh, we have the uh, Alcor and Chronics Institute, very spread, very far apart. Uh, we we don't have the, the opportunity to have all of our patients located in, in both of those states. They're located all, all, everywhere across the world. And it makes that transportation piece of it very difficult, a huge challenge for us again, when it comes to time. So we have to have, first of all, the legal death, training and equip team, where are we located next to the facility? And then what's the availability of commercial transportation? So us, for us, we always try to promote uh, FCP. You know, where is the surgery going to be, be performed? Uh, how will the patient be transported? Where's the facility located? FCP for us is really that bridge between that, uh, that gap in which we're able to do our fluid replacement, cooling, packaging, and introduce the cryoprotectant uh, right there on, spot, on the spot. The standby remains exactly the same. Uh, we introduced a cryoprotectant and then we really bought our time and we have stopped uh, the time that we need to get that patient back to the facility. SCP is really the key to, uh, to all of this as long as there's dry ice availability. You know, once we have dry ice and we, we, we take our cryoprotectant with us, uh, we're able to perform those, uh, those procedures there and, and stop the time. But again, there's some additional uh, training and experience that goes along with that. You can't just teach a volunteer a volunteer team to do that. So traditional uh, SST, oftentimes we run up, we face uh, straight freezes. Um, with FCP, uh, we're going to get a cephalon cryoprotectant, either a neuro on whole body or uh, or a neuro patient. And uh, for us, that's really the, the key for us to eliminating some of those challenges when it comes to time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, as you can see here, I was in Europe, uh, competing in jujitsu. I love Europe. I would love to get back there again. And, uh, I, I hope to see everybody here, uh, in the future and, uh, I will be there next year. I'll make it a point, uh, that, uh, I get there. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Eric, thanks a lot. Uh, we probably have time for one uh, or two short questions. Is there any questions in the audience? Otherwise, so, so one question I have here from someone who listens to the talks remote. Um, do you have to check your equipment? What happens if the airline loses it? That's a great question. Another one of those challenges that we uh, experience. Uh, we do have to check our equipment. We cannot carry it on. Uh, we take upwards of 10 sometimes 12 Pelican cases with us. And that includes all of our surgical equipment, all of our SST equipment, and, and our cryoprotected if we're gonna do FCP. So it has to be checked. We, can't, we, we cannot carry on that equipment. And yes, if it is lost, we are dead in the water. Now, what we do is we put trackers in our luggage. So we use Apple AirTags. Uh, we use um, uh, other devices to be able to, to track. Uh, but for us, the, the Apple Air tags seem to work very well, uh, but it does happen. Luggage does get lost. And, and again, another challenge for us. Then, oh, yeah. Question? Yeah. What happens if the, uh, the TSA doesn't allow on the neuro Right. Eric, real quick. What happens if the TSA doesn't uh, allow a neuro patient to be chipped? chipped? A, a good question. Um, <laughs> it's kind of hit and miss, uh, but uh, what there's times where we have rented the vehicle and driven uh, the cephalon back to the chronic facility. So uh, a long road trip is what happens if we're able to do that. Thank you. All right.
I hear you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings, everybody, and uh, thanks for sticking around uh, long enough for the last uh, talk of the day. So I'm going to focus on crowd preservation of the brain, what's been done in the past, and where this field may be going in the near future. So uh, this talk is going to briefly review past uh, animal studies involving viability testing after brain crowd preservation, uh, review some of the uh, human data on structural crowd preservation of the brain, uh, and then move on to present studies of viability testing uh, of brain in both rabbits and pig models, and then move on briefly to discuss the formation of the brain preservation discussion group this year, and also the mammalian memory crowd preservation initiative. So let's first start off with past studies. So um, perhaps the, the first uh, study on uh, mammalian brain crowd preservation was taken, uh, it was done by uh, two of the giants in the field of crowd biology, Audrey Smith, who discovered the crowd productive properties of glycerol, and James Lovelock, who created the theory of crowd protection that we all uh, go with today. Uh, they were very successful early in the history of crowd biology and got ambitious and started freezing whole hamsters and thawing them out. And the, and the relevance to uh, the, the topic today is that they studied the degree to which different organs formed ice in the frozen state before they resuscitated these animals. And you can see in the areas uh, highlighted in the red boxes that in the brain, they could freeze out up to 63% of the water in the brain. And yet when the animals thawed out, they recovered normal mental functions and could breathe and, and that sort of thing. Um, you see a little experiment at the lower uh, right there involving a primate, which was imported into the UK from Madagascar. That's a Galago. Um, they didn't record the brain preservation results of the Galago, but, um, but, the, uh, but the hamster studies were encouraging. But they didn't use any crowd protective agents, so they were limited to very high sub-zero temperatures, not suitable for long-term storage. Uh, that problem was addressed by uh, Suda et al. in two landmark papers, one in Nature 1966 and one later on in Brain Research 1974 using the apparatus shown at the left, um, they were able to introduce 15% glycerol and then cool the brains to minus 20. And in their nature paper, they showed that after uh, 45 days of storage, they could warm these brains up and get very discernible electroencephalographic traces off of these frozen brains. Uh, they also did additional research, which was reported later, and. Um, uh, and what you see at the bottom of the screen is two autocorelograms, which are, are sort of um, derived from EEG readings in a way that allows you to see the beat frequency of the brain uh, before and after freezing. And after five days at minus 20, the brain EEG signal looked almost the same as in the control state. But these uh, individuals only use 15% glycerol, so they still could not get down to cryogenic temperatures. And that problem was addressed by Natasha Vitamore and, and Danny Belstrano, um, who uh, vitrified uh, C. elegans, uh, a worm that has something akin to a brain at least. And what their results show um, uh, is depicted in this figure. So first two bars, NT, that's non-treated, UT, that's untrained, versus T for trained. Uh, so they're using... Um, uh, an associative learning paradigm uh, to train uh, the worms uh, to remember an experience that they learned before. And the trained result is much higher, as you can see, than the untrained result. The next two bars show the same uh, training regimen, you know, with and without training, but with exposure to a vitrifiable concentration of crop protective agent. As you can see, exposure to the crop protectant had no effect on the ability of these worms to remember what they had learned before. The next two bars, the red bars, are after the worms are vitrified and rewarmed, and there's no difference really between any of those results and the preceding results. And then uh, the, the light bars that follow that are worms that were treated with a less crop protective agent so that they could be frozen 
uh, and, and that, that craftectin treatment did not affect uh, their memories. And then after they were frozen and thawed, they retained their memories as well, even though 80% of the worms died as a result of being frozen and thawed versus 100% survival after vitrification. This shows that the recovery of memory after freezing and thawing is more robust than the recovery of the worm itself. So that's a pretty impressive demonstration that not only can brain uh, structures be preserved, but also memory can be preserved as well, both by freezing and by vitrification. So now we move on to the human level, which of course is very relevant to this group. And you've probably all seen this story before, so I'm gonna go through it fairly briefly, but it's important that everybody know about this information. So Dr. L. Stephen Coles uh, was a prominent uh, uh, discusser of uh, research in aging. Uh, he became terminal, but could not afford crowd preservation. So Alcor agreed to cover his costs in exchange for removing his brain and if to, so we could see if it was cracked or not, and also uh, for sampling to determine his brain's tendency to form ice and the ability of Alcor to deliver crowd protected into his brain, as well as the first light microscopic and electron microscopic examinations of a human brain of an actual Alcor patient after the brain tissue was immersed in liquid nitrogen with the goal of publishing these results in a scientific journal and Dr. Coles actually wanted to be a co-author on this paper, so that will happen. We're working on the publication right now. Uh, the, this is Alcor's perfusion uh, method, uh, loading of, uh, with crowd protectant in the upper left, pretty much the way we do at, at the lab at 21 cm. Uh, lower left is the temperature trace is a little bit above zero for, for low concentrations, a little bit below zero for the higher concentrations. And then the other panel just shows that they use physiological pressures uh, generally of over 100 millimeters of mercury. This is the uh, fracture testing protocol. The whole brain was cooled down at a linear rate to about minus 146, and then slowly warmed back up to minus 140 for long-term storage. And when the brain was removed and examined for cracks, there were no fractures found in the brain. So that was very encouraging. The tissue sampling involves samples about the size that you see here, and they were further subdivided for some of the remaining tests. I'm not going to go into the detail about you know, how you interpret these curves, but these are differential scanning calorimetry traces, demonstrating that no ice formed in Steve Cole's brain samples upon cooling uh, slowly at one degree Celsius per minute and, uh, and warming uh, back from, from uh, minus 90. Uh, at, at high speed. So uh, he was very well crowd protected. And these are just further elaborations. And again, this is a very complicated protocol that you see on the left, which I'm not going to explain to you. But what you see on the right is that when you warm his brain up after going through every gyration possible to encourage ice formation in his brain tissue, there's no melting peaks, meaning that he did not form any ice uh, at all. So his, his brain was extremely well crowd protected. If you look at the permeation of crowd protectants, individual crowd protectant components of M22 into his brain's liquid space, the brain liquid space is about 55% of the total volume of, of the brain. Uh, and you can see that NMF, ethylene glycol, uh, permeated completely, methoxyglycerol, so called, and DMSO uh, penetrated pretty completely, formamide, not so much but the brain was still very vitrifiable because of the shrinkage that uh, was, was uh, experienced, which concentrates proteins and, and contributes to glass formation tendency. Moving on to the light microscopic results, what we saw is the field after field after field. Uh, there's no ice holes in the brain. Everything looks to be there. Uh, the white spaces you see are capillaries. Um, and if you look at a higher magnification, you see the same thing. You see that the uh, molecular inventory of the brain looks like it's there, at least in terms of what we call ground substance. Uh, it's dense, it's compacted because of the shrinkage of the brain, but all of the material seems to be there. And at higher uh, magnification still, you still seem to see uh, everything still being there. And these are not selected data. Now, every once in a while, you'll see things that might look like damage, but I don't believe that this is damage. Um, 
this uh, figure just shows that if you cut uh, through uh, certain areas at a, at a certain angle, it will look like the cells are detached from each other, but that's really not significant. Don't have time to go into any more detail about that, but uh, I, I think that this is really great histology in my opinion. Okay, so, but you really can't tell until you go to the electron microscope level. So this is a series of uh, electron micrograph images of this human brain uh, tissue, which has been uh, taken down to liquid nitrogen temperature and then warmed back up again. You see beautifully preserved capillaries. You see uh, very dense uh, and, and preserved uh, neuropile. You see this black thing in the middle of the screen, which is some kind of pathology that Dr. Coles had before he got crowd preserved. It's not specific to crowd preservation. You see the same thing all over the place. Um, you see a twisted, you know, sort of distorted uh, large axons, but that's not informational. That's not really biological damage. So uh, I would say uh, the structure is very intact. Uh, here's another example, low power electron microscopy, beautifully preserved capillary, less separation of capillaries from the surrounding neuropile than we see in animal brains. Again, a less shrinkage of axoplasm uh, in, in the uh, large axons than you see in animal brains. Uh, much of better preservation of myelin than you see in animal brains. Uh, and then uh, again, just to show you that we see the same thing over and over and over again, no matter where we look, these are not selected images to, you know, made to look uh, good. These are just the way that this was. So now going to even higher uh, power electron microscopy. This is 15,000 X. Uh, this is at the level where you can begin to see some synapses. It's hard to see them in detail because the brain tissue is very shrunken, but you can see that there's sharp demarcation between extracellular shrinkage spaces, which are the white spaces, and uh, the cytoplasm in these very fine neural processes. That means the membranes are intact. You can see the, the synapses, uh, which implies that the connectome is intact as well. Here you see the same thing at 12,000 X. Uh, nicely preserved axoplasm within nicely preserved myelinated uh, myelin sheaths uh, and, and otherwise uh, well-preserved structures and synapses. And uh, here's another shot um, at 22,000 X showing basically the same thing. Here's another shot at uh, 24,000 X showing largely the same thing. So to summarize these human uh, studies, the first ever evaluation of an actual uh, Alcor biostasis case showed no detectable fracturing, no ice crystal formation uh, or damage, uh, no apparent disruption of histology, what I would call good preservation of ultrastructure and hopefully uh, a good uh, uh, connectome preservation and better structure than seen in, in animals. So now let's move on to uh, present day studies. So what we're doing at 21CM is we, we've shown, I think, that we can preserve brain structure. And I skipped over all of this extensive rabbit data in which we partly washed crop activations out to show you that the kind of structures I just showed you for Dr. Cole's brain uh, really uh, does represent intact structure when you begin to dilute out the CPA and, and reduce the shrinkage of the brain. So we believe that we're about ready now to go into viability testing after a variety of background treatments, including uh, low concentrations of crowd protectant and then higher concentrations of crowd protectant. Of course, we have to do our controls, uh, untreated control rabbits and uh, hypothermic rabbits, since you have to add and remove M22 under hypothermic conditions. Eventually, of course, we want to be able to vitrify the brain, rewarm it and test it for viability, but we're a few steps away from being able to do that. Meanwhile, we do have a pig model at the lab and we're going to be testing pig brain viability under somewhat similar uh, conditions uh, overall, although the details of the experiments will be different. This is Ralph Spindler, uh, uh, brain viability testing device. Uh, Ralph is the co-author with me on this pres uh, presentation and he's our point man for brain cryo work at, at 21CM at the moment. Uh, you can see in the middle uh, uh, a tank, uh, which is basically a constant temperature tank. It contains various uh, uh, apparatuses such as oxygenators and uh, 
uh, reservoirs and, and that sort of thing. It's surrounded by pumps, which add and remove water or uh, chemical agents or perfusates uh, to the brain or to the reservoirs. You see at the lower left, the schematic of a rabbit uh, cephalon enclosed in one of these reservoirs. Uh, and I'm not showing you the actual cephalon, but we have done several. This is an example of some of the measurements and some of the techniques that, that, that we're beginning to use. Uh, so uh, in order to maintain a brain at normal temperatures and near normal temperatures, you have to oxygenate it well. In order to do that, you need to have a good oxygen carrier. There are no suitable artificial oxygen carriers at the moment. So we use blood, but it takes a lot of blood. Fortunately, since we have pigs in our facility, we've been able to perfuse rabbit brains with pig blood, which means that we have plenty of blood to do these experiments. And uh, one of the uh, many things that we're looking at in terms of assessing the uh, integrity of the brain is uh, uh, brain uh, blood flow. Uh, and you can see a couple of examples of, of, of that kind of investigation. Uh, along the top, what you see is a Doppler um, uh, blood flow uh, readout uh, showing a normal rabbit's uh, uh, mid-cerebral artery blood flow. You see the hand holding the probe uh, next to the appropriate area on the rabbit so we can record this. This is something that can be applied to measure blood flow during isolated cephalon perfusion under normal thermic conditions. Another way that you can look at blood flow is just by putting a dye into the perfusate. Uh, and so th these uh, examples along the bottom show that if you take a brain and you perfuse it under hypothermic conditions for increasing periods of time, uh, you can get a so-called no reflow phenomenon developing even under hypothermic conditions uh, if, you, if you don't do it right, uh, which means that when you now put it into the brain viability testing device and you uh, put the dye into the perfusate, uh, you see that after uh, perfusion for longer and longer times of hypothermia, when you now uh, reperfuse at normal thermia, the dye does not distribute itself uh, well throughout the brain. So um, this is obviously important. If you don't have uh, blood flow back to the brain, you're not going to have brain function either. We have been able to overcome this recently, but it's it's a good illustration of, uh, of the importance of, of these assay procedures. I think one of the most interesting things to look at, of course, is EEGs. Uh, so what you see on the left is a Massimo EEG system. It enables us to measure EEGs without implanting electrodes into the brain. So these are surface recordings and you can see some respectable uh, wiggles at the top of, of that the Massimo screen on the left. But one of the reasons that we chose the Massimo system is it reduces all of this down to a single number called the patient state index. Uh, and that is a general indication of the state of awareness of the, of the cephalon. And uh, what you see at the upper strip is recovery of the state index as uh, an anesthetized control animal wakes up from anesthesia. You can see it's low at the beginning and it comes up uh, to a high level as the animal wakes up. And our uh, goal would be to look at the gray zone between the uh, totally blank uh, state uh, and, and the awake state so that we can demonstrate brain function in anesthetized cephalons, uh, even though we can't bring them all the way back to full awareness. Uh, now, a more interesting experiment shown in the bottom in which we've taken the cephalon and we've perfused it at 35 degrees with blood. Uh, and you can see that although it takes a while, after about 40 minutes or so, as indicated by the arrow, uh, the state index begins to come back, represented by those black dots at the bottom of the screen, which means that we do have an assay system that we can apply to crowd-protected brains. We have begun to do some crowd protection experiments. What you see at the top is loading of a brain uh, up to one molar uh, crowd protective agent. Uh, that's the top panel on the top, and, and the bottom panel on the top shows the uh, brain's uh, 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 perfusate flow increasing uh, as we increase the crowd protecting concentration up to the one molar level. What you see at the bottom is that if we do this in a normal way without opening up, opening up the blood-brain barrier, there's some mild brain shrinkage, actually more mild than I would expect. But if you use SDS to open up the blood-brain barrier, a la Yuri Kachugin's trick, uh, you can prevent that brain shrinkage as compared to brain weights that are obtained under 
uh, short and long-term hypothermic conditions, which are the gray and, uh, and uh, light orange bars uh, to, the, to the right. Uh, this shows uh, application of the Maslow system to our pig model. You can vaguely see the pig in the background uh, recovering from anesthesia. The Maslow system in the front uh, uh, recording the data. And then the uh, state index is uh, obviously in the upper left panel. And you can see that there's quite a, a, a good uh, amount of territory between a completely anesthetized pig and a pig that's uh, beginning to wake up and, and move around uh, uh, with, at the higher state index levels. So we think that, uh, that this system will actually allow us to measure EEGs uh, after we crowd protect uh, both rabbit and pig brains. So where are we going uh, that we haven't gone yet? Uh, well, we're beginning to look at a lot of different possibilities. This year, I was approached by uh, uh, Regina Monaco, who's the lady on the upper right uh, of this uh, panel, and then coincidentally by Laura Jenks, who's the lady on the upper left uh, panel. Um, and um, these are both neurobiologists who spontaneously decided they were interested in brain crowd preservation, and so they contacted me to talk it over. And um, over time, you know, I realized that uh, we had several people that are interested in this, and so we put together the brain preservation discussion group earlier this year. Um, that's Ramses Alcade uh, next to Laura Jenks. Uh, he's an information technology specialist. And uh, as I mentioned, Laura and, and Regina are neurobiologists. And then next to um, Ramses, you have the very well known to this crowd, uh, uh, Alexandra Stolzing. Uh, she's interested in brain resuscitation. And I expect her to be uh, taking up shop in my lab uh, hopefully before the end of this year to help us learn how to keep brains happy during these brain viability testing experiments. Uh, and uh, we have another anonymous uh, uh, member of the discussion group indicated by that black box, but the discussion groups also in, uh, includes the usual suspects of Brian Woke, uh, Ralph Spindler, myself, and we just added Ashwin DeWolf. Ashwin actually is not discussed anything yet, but we just made him a member of the group. So welcome aboard Ashwin. So one of the things that uh, we're trying to move forward with, uh, uh, Monica, I mean, uh, Regina and I are going to um, try to do uh, a new kind of experiment uh, in this realm. You might call it a brain in a dish experiment, but the object of it is to be able to prove that complex mammalian memories can be crowd preserved. And um, what you see in the center is a figure taken from a paper I'll introduce to you in the next slide. Uh, and that, that, uh, that uh, illustration shows uh, brain cells in a dish in the middle, but they're being talked to by a multi-electrode array uh, and their responses are being recorded from another uh, multi-electrode array. Uh, and um, this means that you can talk to the brain uh, cells. So in a way, this is a little mini brain uh, and you can teach it things, and then you can look and see if it remembered what you taught it. So this overcomes all of the mechanical problems of dealing with whole brains, but it preserves the basic brain biology of memory and learning. Uh, and so it should be a really excellent model to look at for proving that not just nematode memories, but also mammalian memories can actually be crowd preserved. This slide gives a little bit more detail. So DeMars is the one who came up with this uh, and published uh, in 2004. And uh, what you see on the left is an airplane whose uh, position can be changed uh, and whose uh, position can be recorded uh, by a video camera. So what you see on the right is that the image of the airplane is recorded by a video uh, capture device, which is sent to a computer. And then that information is relayed to the brain cells in the dish. The brain cells in the dish then can be taught to uh, control the attitude of that plane to keep the wings horizontal instead of letting the plane, quote, crash, unquote. And uh, so the, the output of the brain cells in this neural net is fed back to another computer which is fed back to the airplane. So we can see what the brain cells are doing by watching what happens to the airplane. Meanwhile, the brain cells are watching the airplane and trying to keep the wings straight. This is a, obviously a pretty complicated uh, 
uh, maneuver involving lots of different synaptic connections and so forth. And uh, if we can teach the brain cells in a dish the a complicated um, uh, memory uh, or, or skill such as this, and then crowd preserve the brain cells and warm them back up and show that that memory still persists, it'll be very convincing evidence that uh, the molecular mechanisms of uh, memory and, and, uh, and of learning are, are preserved uh, in mammalian systems. Uh, not just nematodes, but in actual brain cells. So, of course, we'd like to know if those networks will remember after crowd preservation, but uh, we'd like to see if we can then, if, if that's successful, can we go on to train a hippocampal slice to do the same thing? Can we teach a hippocampal slice to fly an airplane? The nice thing about doing that sort of thing is that that's such a discrete and obvious memory that if you can, if you can demonstrate it, then there's no question that you've trained uh, the slice to do something. And the beauty of that is that the hippocampus is where memories are normally formed in the, in the intact brain. So now we're not just talking about an artificial system of just uh, uh, molecular biology, we're actually talking about brain circuits. And then if we could make that work, could we actually teach a hippocampus in the intact brain to fly an airplane also, which is clearly a little bit more complicated, but that is not necessarily beyond the realm of possibility. And if we can do that, then we could demonstrate in an intact whole brain that we could recover a complex memory out of the brain. And that's not the only way we could do it, but this is a way that gives us a functional output of actual memories. So it's kind of attractive if we can get there. So in conclusion, I would say that brain crowd preservation is a viable and surprisingly, it's a rapidly growing area of research right now. People are beginning to get interested in this. And if we could demonstrate viability after at least crowd protection of, of the brain or, or even better still after vitrification, obviously it would change the way biostasis is regarded by uh, both the lay and the scientific and the medical communities, which would have a huge impact on that field. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, I believe that there are exciting possibilities for proving that complex mammalian memories can be crowd preserved using techniques that can be applied in the not too distant future. So I wanna thank everybody for your attention. I wanna thank Alcor and Steve Coles and his wife, Natalie Coles, who was instrumental in the human structural experiments that I related to you, which was an important milestone along the way to dis, you know, to proving that this sort of endeavor has uh, some uh, scientific basis and some potential. I wanna thank the European Biostasis Foundation and Emil for inviting me to participate. I have to thank uh, all of the people at 21st Century Medicine uh, for helping me with all of the experimental results, including particularly Ralph uh, and, and Brian uh, for their role in the brain crowd preservation research that I shared with you today, as well as much other research. And of course, the, the new members of our uh, brain uh, preservation discussion group, including the anonymous one that I do not have a photograph for uh, you for right now. Uh, and of course, Bill Falloon and Saul Kent, who have been instrumental in allowing our lab to stay open all these years, uh, currently uh, via the mechanism of uh, the uh, Biomedical Research and Longevity Society. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if the, we have any time, of course, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. I'm having a little bit of, yeah, good question. Um, I am working on it. Uh, the, a lot, lot of sections have been written, but uh, we still have a fair amount of crunching to do on, on examination of all of the micrographs. Um, uh, I'm hoping it'll be published next year. That's all I can say. Yes, uh, I skipped over those details, but uh, it was perfused, uh, I believe a little over three hours uh, post-mortem. Uh, 
he did have a standby at a local hospice. Uh, he had the good sense to move to uh, Scottsdale uh, prior to uh, experiencing cardiac arrest. He had a typically long agonal course of several days of hypotension. So his case was not perfect. Uh, no case really is. Um, and uh, But there were people at his bedside when he uh, uh, had uh, a cardiac arrest. And so he was transported to Alcor. Perfusion began, I, if memory serves, somewhere around three, three and a half hours uh, after that. Uh, and he was, uh, he was uh, perfused with the uh, machinery that uh, is used for that purpose on a standard basis at Alcor. Just, just to uh, take off on that last question for a moment, I know there's a prominent uh, MD uh, in Spain who uh, has his doubts about biostasis because he feels that if uh, the brain is uh, perfused more than three hours post-mortem, it's not gonna perfuse at all, and therefore you're not gonna be able to crowd protect it. And obviously uh, that is not the case as, as that uh, is, as C. Cole's case demonstrates. Thanks a lot. Have a good day and talk to All you right. soon and see you soon. All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Twenty twenty two. I hope to see you all next year, either in a workshop format or maybe pure workshop, um, maybe training, um, maybe a presentation or, or like a conference with talks again. We're going to figure that out in the next couple of weeks and then announce Biostasis 2023. Until then, I'm more than happy to have you had all here in, in Switzerland. And of course, I would also like to thank everybody who joined us remotely. And a couple of times during these days, we said, reach out, let's start working together. So one last call to action to actually do that. And until then, um, I would like to thank you for attending and then seeing you soon. Thank you.